Welcome to True House Stories. My name is Lenny Fontana coming out of NYC. And this week, I have to thank again my assistant Karen for annoying Mr. Greg Wilson to please come on and share your story with us. And he finally agreed, and I'm so privileged to have him here. He is one of our electro gods from the time of the mid 80s. He is known for having a, a radio show that was unprecedented on, Rick, on Radio Piccadilly, if I remember correctly, back in the day, for those that remember the Manchester area. He has traveled from continent to continent with a reel to reel to preach those editing sounds that he plays in his sets. He's been around a long time. Now he is, not only did he run a blog for years, he decided to put down a pause and write a book to share with everyone the stories that he learned and unearthed along the way. Enough of me trying to tell you who it is. Now, let me thank him for coming on. I'd like to welcome Mr. Greg Wilson from the UK. <laughs> I know studio audience, but that's my studio audience. Thank you, mate. And thank you for putting aside everything for the day before New Year's, which technically you'll be playing tonight or tomorrow. Yeah, well, it would be in the old days. Pre, pre, uh, Pre-pandemic? pre Yeah, unfortunately. I was just saying, you know, off camera before that I've just had a, a gig cancelled for the fourth, fourth time because every time they set it up, there's a new tier amount, uh, you know, announced and... Uh, and there it goes again. So I mean, New Year's Day, I think that's gone now. So that was my only gig since I did one in the summer, a socially distanced one. And before that, it was March when I was on, in Australia on tour. And interesting that you said about Australia, because I saw how it was all taking off there. I was there as they were starting lockdown. It was kind of a bit hairy getting out of the country. But what I respected about them there was that they got a hold of it. The earliest opportunity it was just straight away. They didn't mess around. Um, they have a situation, you know, like you said about Brisbane. I spoke to um, some of the guys I know in Perth, Greg Packer, Dr. Packer. He said he's been DJ. I mean, not right, Perth. I mean, Perth. Um, yeah, right. Perth area, not Brisbane. Brisbane's on the East Coast. I mean, per I meant Perth before. They have li they're living like there's no COVID. It's crazy. Well, that's where I was. I was there just as they locked down. The only reason my gig went ahead was it was a 500 capacity. Everything above that, they closed that night. So it was literally right on the cusp of it all. And um, nobody knew what was going to happen. I came back to the UK. And I mean, the, the, uh, the figures were pretty much the same at the time in Australia and the UK. But within literally weeks and certainly months, it was crazy. It was, there was more people who were dying in the region I live in than the whole of Australia. And that's because we just reacted so late to everything every time, you know. Um, our reaction was maybe two weeks behind what it should have been. And it still is. You know, it's still going on now. There's going to be a lot of people suffer over uh, this kind of festive season because, you know, the social distancing with many people has just gone right out the window. Look, I'm going to be real with you, and everybody knows my love for this, my country. I love the UK. I mean, without the UK, I wouldn't have the career I've had. But these governments are frickin' frack, both of them, running the show here. Um, in the beginning, they had, they had all the technology and the technical breakdown of what this was going to be, and both of them kept it quiet a little too long you know one said on my side he didn't want to alert the americans to how bad it was i mean you had to kind of tell us how bad it was yeah. and now we're at 300 almost twenty thousand gone <laughs> you know that number should never have been even sixty thousand. but yeah. well we must I, go on i think it says something about the western world at the minute yeah I think so. All right. Let's get into this. <laughs> we got our politics out the side. First question everybody knows how I start. We always start from the first. We want to start with the young guy, young kid, young Greg finding music. How does music find you, Mr. Greg Wilson? Okay. Well, I was born in uh, like a seaside town. Uh, it's like in England, you know, you've got like Blackpool, which is like the Coney Island of England with the big fur ground and everything. And where I'm from is a place called New Brighton, which is about 40 miles down coast. 
that tried, you know, the turn of the, um, you know, like 1900s, the 20th century, were, were basically um, trying to compete with Blackpool, and built a bigger tower and everything, but it never quite worked out. But it was a day trip resort and people came over, there were ferries in, there were fur grounds, uh, there was a huge outdoor swimming pool and, you know, people would come here uh, throughout the summer on bank holidays for day trips. My family run a guest house originally in the early 60s when I was born. And then we moved into um, a pub um, and we had functions rooms above the pub where they had weddings and 21st and all those kind of events. And we lived above that. So, you know, by the age of six, seven, music was just all around me. There were mobile discos coming in and out to where I lived. I'd sit behind the bar with my mom and have a coke while, you know, she was working and there'd be people playing music. When I was out and about, and I was a bit feral when I was a kid, I was out on my own just around New Brighton and it was transistor radios everywhere playing. If the fairgrounds would have music coming from the rides. And so all that was going on. And on top of that, uh, my brother and sister, who were both older, fortunately for me, had the good taste that the records that they were bringing into the house were like on uh, Tamla Motown, Stax, Atlantic. Um, they were all the soul artists of the time. So basically what was happening was that my first love in music at a very young age was, was very much black music. Um, and so by the age of 9, 10, 11, you know, I was devouring these records of um, my siblings and then started buying records of my own, you know, so by uh, kind of by early teens, I'd already amassed a decent record collection for myself. Um, and then, you know, uh, I don't know when you said before, when you started out at parties, I, I don't know whether you had to take your own equipment with you or anything, uh, that was the case. But back then, the apprenticeship really for a DJ uh, was mobile discos. Uh, and I got my own mobile disco at 15. I had a, a school friend who, who, who built his a couple of years before that. You know, he was into electronics and everything. So I bought, built, bought his old, old system and started to put myself out there for, you know, events and stuff and parties. And... Um, no sooner had I done that than I played above a local club and the DJ didn't turn up as these things happen and um, I ended up going downstairs, leaving the guy I worked up with to do the wedding or whatever it was and um, I landed that residency at 15 and, and by the age of 16, before I'd left school, I was working six and seven nights a week throughout the region. I mean, I literally kind of gave up my school in that last six months. <laughs> hardly went in you know and when I did I was almost like falling asleep in class because I was just like full time working as a club DJ for so so what records at that time were you were you playing at that time in the beginning of, of that 15 16 year old career well I mean right at the start of that you're looking at uh, December 75 which was when I started that's when you've got like a love to love you baby coming out so in a sense we're, we're looking at that kind of start of disco as we know it i mean we had that proto period beforehand with like philadelphia international and all sorts of stuff kind of evolving from soul and funk into disco but i think the the kind of that 76 coming into 76 was when for me that whole kind of movement really you know built steam you know went to a different level right I mean, that's, I don't know how you would view that from a New York perspective, whether you'd say Well, it's that's funny because in New York, you know, discos were already started earlier, you know. I mean, we, we, we had them. I mean, but I, I just, in terms, so, so for example, 1974 is a crucial time for disco music and black music in the UK because you had, after a period of years where there were no black artists topping the UK charts, I think three came along at once. Uh, it was George McRae, Rock Your Baby. It was The Three Degrees, When Will I See You Again, and Carl Douglas, Kung Fu Fighting, which was a, a British track, but was also huge in, in America too. Oh my God, huge? Yeah. And so those three came in, in, in 74, and I think that had a big bearing on what happened in the US, because, you know, obviously the industry 
would sit up and say, because you had Rock Your Baby, I'm sorry, Rock the Boat as well, Youth Corporation was massive that summer too. Um, that wasn't quite a number one hit, but it was big, you know. So I think that from an industry level in America, that that would have been seen as, you know, there's, there's a lot of money to be made in this in these dance beats. And um, and so I think from the UK, the, the reaction was kind of coming on the back of that, but really stepped in 76 the first year the 12 inch came and everything you can see so many of the changes you know so i th i see that from a uk perspective as it was coming out of the funk soul kind of era into um, what would become the disco era although they were always closely aligned and crossed over you know i mean a lot of soul and funk was disco you know i mean originally Disco as a category was just the music that was played in clubs and discotheques. It wasn't a standalone genre as such. That kind of came later, really. That's exactly right. And the thing about it was, this is what makes everyone wonder. Every time when you mention the word disco or discotheque, they just knew it as music to go dancing to. They didn't say about, oh, I'm going to go buy disco. You know, Isaac Hayes is releasing an album. He's not a disco artist. He's a soul artist. Yep. You know, I mean, Curtis Mayfield, same thing. They're not looked at as a disco group or yeah, disco yeah. artist. These are these are R and B soul artists. You know, I mean, it's such a problematic term as well because of what happened later with the whole Comiskey Park thing and the disco oh. movement and. And even now in America, you know, because you have a disconnect that is, is different from the UK in so much as when House happened in the UK, it went mainstream. And as Frankie Knuckles said, House was Disco's revenge. And so it was, we understood the kind of continuation of these kind of things. Whereas I think there was a disconnect in America that House was never a big commercial force. But here's the most important question. Even though it ended in America and it went underground, why in the UK did dance music stay so prevalent and never go underground? Even with pre-disco, uh, pre-house music, you guys kept it going. It never ended for you all. It was always something that you all embraced. But I mean, I, I kind of think that we had an underground that went back to the early 60s uh, with, with strength. I mean... If you go back to that point in time and, and, and you get into the moment when rather than uh, a DJ being an MC who had a record deck and played a record or two between bands that were playing live to, to actually having two turntables and it's becoming the main feature of the night. So that you can see the start of that in certainly in the early 60s, probably happened late 50s. But then you have like, DJs like uh, Guy Stevens, he was at the scene in London, which was the big mod club. It wasn't a big club. It wasn't, the, I think it only held maybe 150 people, 200 people, but they were all the right people. It was the original mods in London. And he was playing rhythm and blues and, um, and ska. And you had like uh, also across town, a black DJ called Count Suckle who'd come over from Jamaica in the previous decade. And back then he, had, he was a sound system guy. The Jamaicans then were all playing rhythm and blues because there was no reggae. Um, and it was out of rhythm and blues that kind of scar emerged by taking it on the offbeat. And so that all filters through into the early 60s. So Count Suckle uh, at a club called the Roaring Twenties on Carnaby Street, he's got all the, you know, pop nobility, the musicians from the Stone, the Animals and even probably a Beatle went in there, you know, and Mick Jagger used to lend his records and stuff. So all this is going on very early 60s. Across in Manchester, you've got a guy called Roger Eagle who's come up from Oxford, massive record enthusiast. Um, and he starts at the club, The Twisted Wheel, and um, playing blues and rhythm and blues, bringing over some incredible artists, you know, like, Sonny Boy Williamson, Howlin' Wolf, all these characters are being brought to Manchester in the early 60s. And they're importing the music. They've made the connections with chess in Chicago and all the right. labels, and they're getting the records direct. So the import sources were already opened up in the early 60s in the UK. And these are the foundations that we would build from. So when I start playing, 
on the underground scene in the late 70s, early 80s, all the, sh the shops that are in place are shops that were opened in the 60s to cater for this demand. Roger Eagle started um, uh, one of the earliest rhythm and blues magazines you know, in the, in the UK. Blues and Soul magazine was going from, I think, 67 with America, all the American music listed. And so we knew our stuff. I mean, or, or I say we. Well, it's, it's true. It's true because every time somebody steps from the first generation, all of you know everything that goes, that went down with them. Whereas somebody here on my side of the pond barely even knows what they did yesterday but you guys know the whole bio and history i always credit that to all of you that your homework that was done to you know to to keep up on everyone was incredible it's an island mentality it's an obsessiveness because you see it in japan as well how obsessive they are about oh. the detail of documentation and we're like that here in the uk too um and it goes back i think this love affair with black music um, really, you know, uh, goes back to the Second World War when the black GIs came over and they were in clubs and people were seeing the level of dancing because it was, it was all the kind of, uh, you know, the back end of uh, Lindy Hop and all that, you know, jiving and stuff. Um, and, you know, I think at, at that point people were engaging. I mean, there's a great Martin Scorsese documentary about the blues and this, uh, one of the parts is about the UK. And this, I can't remember who it was, but they're talking about at some point in the 50s that they lived on one side of London and they heard that somebody, I think they maybe lived in the west of London, they heard somebody in the south had a copy of a Muddy Waters album and they went and got the tube and got over there, knocked on the guy's door and said, can you just show me the sleeve? And that was the level of obsession that we Wow, that's, that's passion. People. So, yeah, you take, I mean, that's why you have a scene like Northern Soul, you know, because it just takes it to the end, you know, that people are, are hunting down the rarest of the can rare. You, can you define the Northern Soul for people um, that, that maybe don't really know what that they've heard the term. Yeah. Um, it's it, it, there's a dancing that goes on with it, of course. But can you can you give us a definition of what in a, in in your words what that really is? Okay. Well, in the '60s, uh, Motown, as as we all know it, um, in America they released all their records under different labels: Tamla, Soul, Gordy, VIP, uh, Motown, but. In the UK, um, I think from 65 onwards, uh, it all came under the banner of Tamla Motown as a label. It was a black label with a big 45. And this label was magical. I mean, the amount of hits that came. And so we didn't even say Motown at the time. We said Tamla. We called it Tamla. You know, but, but that sound, I mean, for me, that's the original disco music. That's the, the music that brought people onto the dance floors back in, in, the, in the 60s. And it was so massive. And we had the Motown Review coming over to the UK, as well as the Stax Vault Tour. Um, uh, and so the, the soul scene was already in place throughout the 60s. There was a great love of soul music and rhythm and blues. But as it gets to the end of the 60s and touching into the early 70s, that's where funk's coming into play. And so the music's changing. And with a certain amount of people, and, and, and this happened at this club, The Twisted Wheel in Manchester, the DJ I mentioned, Roger Eagle, was long gone by this point. He'd moved on, it had moved location, uh, but he'd set the seeds for it. And what happened later was that um, people started bringing in rare records that, uh, maybe from the earlier part of the 60s and the DJs started playing them. Out of that came a couple of hit. One got to number one in the UK, which was the Tam, Say Girl, But Don't Bother Me, which had been released, I think, in either 63 or 4 and did nothing at the time. All of a sudden was number one in the charts. Tammy Lynn, I'm Going to Run Away From You was another one. So all of a sudden there was these records being revived via the Twisted Wheel and all the other clubs that were looking towards the Twisted Wheel for, you know, direction and stuff. Um, and, and that was the result of 
people not wanting to let go of this Motown sound, especially that mid '60s, uh, as a you know some that kind of sound of uh, "Reach Out, I'll Be There" by the Four Tops, or or even I can't help myself, maybe a little bit more up tempo, whatever. But that era of, of music was what these people loved and um, we'd moved on those records weren't being made so what did they do they realized that at the time these records were being made in detroit alone there were loads and loads and loads of little labels that were trying to make their motown sounding records and they hadn't been successful and maybe 500 copies have been pressed and that was it and so that became the source that they started to mine and as it went on, it went into digging trips to America. There was one particular DJ called Ian Levine, who's sure. a UK DJ. Another legend, um, Ian Levine. He probably discovered more stuff than anyone. I mean, he, his family were pretty wealthy and uh, they were flying across to the States regularly in the 70s. He was going over there discovering the, um, you know, the, 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 the scenes out there, but... He was like doing things like sitting in a warehouse in Miami for a few days and then carting back a couple of thousand seven inches. He couldn't listen to the records, but some he knew the labels, others he liked the sound of, others he saw the producer from a different record. And they go back to the UK and him and Colin Curtis, who were the DJs at Blackpool Mecca, which was a very, very important venue. We all hear all about the casino, Wigan, which was, you know, the Studio 54 of the Northern Soul scene, so to speak. But somewhere like the Mecca, you know, would be closer to like the, the gallery or something like that. It was such an important venue in, in making it all. And it was normal club hours there. So they were open between nine and two and the casino was an all night and that started in 74 and that would be open from two to late so people would go to the mecca early doors and then go to the casino and there's even compilation albums of the last hour of the mecca because a lot of people left early to get to the casino so the djs could become more experimental in that last hour and they played stuff into that so there's even now you can buy a compilation of the last hour of the mecca and colin <laughs> curtis was the other dj there and him and levine had sit sift through all these records and find these gems, some of which are now absolutely well known across the, the whole Northern Soul scene that, that then were, were lost records. So it was a scene that basically, uh, you know, was built on failure, on the failure of, of records previously that they hadn't sold when they were first released. Well, that's kind of like the hip hop scene. Well, uh, you know. In the beginnings, because some of these records, like Apache, these are records that were not hits. Yeah. By no means. Yeah. yeah. Arawak All Stars. They bought the record on how the cover looked. Yeah. Uh, exactly. I mean, with the Northern Soul scene, people would be selling records at gigs. They'd be bringing, you know, little boxes of rec seven inches down and. And it became a lucrative business, you know. Um, it, it was a very, very intricate, involved scene, apart from the dancing side of it, the drugs. I mean, it was very amphetamine-based with it being all-nighters. Um, you know, the record sales. I mean, the most famous record in terms of selling was um, Frank Wilson, Do I Love You Indeed I Do, um, which to me, it's not a great record. In fact, Barry Gordy didn't think so. They, they promoted it. And he tried it and didn't work. But he called in and he, he, he brought Frank Wilson in and said, look, I don't know if it's going to work for you as an artist. You should be a producer. And he then worked with Norman Whitfield and eventually he, you know, the foundation disco track, Girl, You Need to Change Your Mind, Eddie Kendricks, is Frank Wilson production. But this track from 65, Do I Love You Indeed, I Do, no one knew about it. Even the Motown and, uh, you know, uh, kind of experts in the UK, this track was not known. And there was a guy called Simon Suzanne, who was a very famous bootlegger on the Northern Soul scene. So <laughs> it's always a famous bootlegger. Yeah. It's always he, one. Shady he actually became a disco producer later. He did uh, a Peggio and all that kind of stuff. He did Love and Desire, right? Yeah, 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 he did. Simon Suzanne. Wow. But, I didn't realize he was a bootlegger. Wow. Oh, yeah. He's, he's notorious within Northern Soul circles. And he, he relocated to L.A., Okay, and I think this is 76 now I'm talking about. And while he was there, I don't know if you remember, you, think, but you will remember, Richie family, the best disco in town. That sure, we had them on, we had them on as a, one of our guests. Yes, yeah. I do. Well, it was Dr. Morale, Dr. Morale production. Yeah, well, what, what 
they, Sam and Suzanne decided that he wanted to do a, um, a record that was a medley of Motown tracks. It was originally going to be Northern Soul, but another DJ guy up called Ian Dewhurst, who was out there with him at the time, said, well, Northern Soul, they might not get it over here. Why don't we do Motown? So they did Uptown Festival by Shalimar. Yeah? Yeah, I remember that. Uh, the, the, the name of the band even comes from the Northern Soul scene because there was a famous record by the Shalimars, and that's where they got that name from. Now... When he was in LA, his first port of call to see where he was going to kind of try and sign this track, he went to Motown. And I can't remember the name of the guy, but one of the executives there, and he was in his office and they were chatting and blah, blah, blah. And he let him have a look in his cupboard. And as he's looking through the cupboard, he sees this seven inch that he's never seen before on Soul. Do I love you indeed? I do, Frank Wilson. I'm not sure how he did it, but he got it out of the office. <laughs> yeah. I think he lent it, but it was a loan that was never returned. And that record came out of the office and basically came straight back to Wigan Casino, where it was covered up as Eddie Foster. So they took the original name off so that nobody could find it. And it just, it was the last big casino discovery blew up. Um, and that copy then started selling hands, 500 it went for. Uh, a guy, do you remember a band called Shack Attack, a British? Sure, I remember Shack Attack. They were signed, they were signed later to Polygram or something, Universal. The, the, the guy who, who, um, who, who looked after them bought it first, and then it was, went to a DJ called Jonathan Woodliffe, who paid a grand for it or something. And basically down the years now, I think the last sale was about 10 years ago, 25,000. So they were to the same seven-inch single? Uh, they've only found two copies, I think. Uh, I mean, Gordy might have copies, but I think there's two that they... Everything was destroyed at the time. They didn't... I don't think they even promoed it. It was, it was a promo, but I don't think they, they sent it out to radio or anything like that. They just destroyed the copies, probably kept a few here and there. And this one copy now, the last tag on it was 25 grand and, and, and rising, you know, all the time. Damn. That's and soul for you. That's Northern Soul. That's the passion of Northern Soul. <laughs> but I was never a part of the Northern Soul scene. I mean, no, I know that. I know you. The side where I'm from, it never took off in Liverpool. Um, it never took off with the black crowd, of course, because it was a white working class movement of uh, black music obsessives. Whereas at the same time, black people would not be wanting to listen to that music because it was old stuff that their parents listened to. The young kids wanted to listen to Curtis Maysfield and uh, wanted to listen to, to you know, the, the funk bands like Parliament and Funkadelic. They didn't want to be in the past. So uh, the, there were very few black people on the Northern Soul scene. There was a black presence, but it was a very small one. There were no black Northern Soul DJs, for example, or anything like that. But the scene was like very heavily documented. Everything's been written about it. You know, there's so many books. But at the same time, the, the black scene was completely ignored, you know, in, in many respects. But there was amazing things happening as well mm -hmm. within clubs where, you know, in, in Liverpool, there was a club called The Timepiece that I went to myself when I was 16. And it was a revelation. It was the first time I've been in a predominantly black environment as a white kid. And, you know, there was that feeling of, am I out of my depth here? But then you, the music you're hearing is everything you want to hear in a club. And you're looking at the dancing and it's on a different level to what you're used to in, in the kind of clubs that you're involved in. And the DJ was a guy called Les Spain, who still a friend now, uh, incredible character, had so much respect. I had all the other DJs from Merseyside. They did all-nighters as well on, on, on every Saturday. And all the other DJs came after the clubs and they were taking notes of what he was playing. You know, he was just a huge, huge figure in Liverpool. He retired and went to work for Motown and worked closely with people like Stevie Wonder, Marvin Gaye, and eventually, you know, ran his own companies and stuff like that. And we'd been involved in the business. But he, you know, what they were doing, I mean... At the timepiece, you were having a lot of Americans come in who were stationed, um, soldiers and uh, Air Force who were stationed over here at the time. It was Vietnam War time. And they'd come every weekend for their R&R, &R, you know, to Liverpool. And um, there was this massive scene that went on for a good number of years. Um, and I was, thankfully, I was exposed to that. And I could see where I wanted to go to from there. And fortunately for me, 
five years later, I found that type of environment in right. Manchester and that type of audience, you know. But, so so when I, probably people are going to ask this question. The question I would like to ask is, in 74, 75, 76, were you already mixing or were you doing like a lot of the UK guys were doing, playing in between one record and the other and talking? Before microphone, that was DJing as far as the UK was concerned. Uh, as for mixing, the the first real impetus for mixing was in 78. There was a guy who wrote for a magazine called Record Miracle, James Hamilton, very important, one of the people in the book, who really championed it. He, he was going back and forth to America. He went um, to the original music, new music seminar and stuff like that. So he, he kind of knew what was going on. But in 78, when it was kind of pushed out there kind of for the first time, Everyone had a little go at it, but we didn't have the equipment. We didn't have very speed turntables. We had direct drive. So if you tried to manipulate it in any way, the record, you know, the needle's going to jump up. So unless you've got two records that run exactly in time, you might get four or five beats in time and call it a mix. And that, so it wasn't practical until we had the equipment. And that really didn't come into play until the early 80s. So by the time I get to Legend in 1980, I've got three SL1200s. These are the first I've ever seen in a club in the UK. You know, I, they, they don't, they're not there. You know, we, our sound equipment was awful in the 70s. You know, we, we were way behind. I didn't realise so much until I went to work in Europe. I, I worked as a kind of DJ doing monthly contracts in Europe in 1978 and 80. And you were on a different level in terms of the equipment that they were using and the sound quality. Um, and that didn't properly come into play until right back end of the 70s in the UK. Clubs like the Warehouse in Leeds and Wigan Pier, Legend, Camden Palace in London. Mm -hmm. uh, we started getting the sound systems installed. And, um, and then, you know, the whole concept of mixing, you know, it, it, it became the way to go, of course, because, you know, we now had the environment and everything for it. But previous to that, um, microphone was it, you know, and people, you know, I, I often think about how people, you know, think that it must have sounded, you know, timing wise and everything, but the best DJs on the mic always had a fluidity to the way they did it. They were back announcing on the end of the last record and they were bringing the next record in underneath as they were still talking. The technicality was voice. So it was like, like Tony Prince did, like you just have the record playing and you'd be like, okay, boys and girls, here we go with the next big track coming right behind it. And boom, here we go. Put your hands on the air screen. Yeah! And then the crowd would go nuts. And for them, that was a night out. Yeah, right. That, that, that was how they generate the atmosphere. You know, um, I mean, some were very personality based, a lot of DJs. I mean, the biggest DJ in, in England in the seventies on a club level was Chris Hill. Who, yes, I remember him too, his name, yes. He, he was at the seminar in 79, quite controversial. They all came into Disco Forum, Forum yeah. 3, I think that was, in 79. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, I, I know the comments he made about that, he was kind of critical about what was going on in New York because, you know, it was a big time for jazz funk in the UK and the music that we were playing, you know, was a little bit different from the New York disco sound. That big time was, difference, yeah. very different. Although there were lots of crossovers, of course, you know, I mean, it, it all crosses over. Well, what we found with the English and the UK crowd was that you had a big love for jazz. Yeah. So what was going on was in that late 70s, you having that transfusion of that fusion jazz sound with the disco beat. Yeah, exactly. You know, right. Like you mentioned Shack Attack is a lot of records like that. Uh, Lion List of Smith. Yeah. Um, Hi. That for us was we, we, we saw that as a bit of a foul, you know, we, they, they were like one of the poorer British examples of it, but there were very good British examples. There were a lot of great British records made in that period that, you know, and, and, and what's the sad thing is it's the, the look down on from a British perspective, not American. I know that DJs in New York saw all these British records as really exotic and, diff, you know, I mean, a fantastic example is Love Money, uh, T.W. Funkmaster. Oh, yes. Larry the Man killed that record. He just, he made that record what it was. <laughs> I mean, th that was a, j a massive track on the jazz funk scene in the UK. That's where it was played. Uh, there were two versions. There was an original version on Tanya, 
1980. And then the following year, Champagne put out one with the edited version, which was the main version that, you know, would be played. And for, from our perspective, it was just a great record that was huge on the jazz funk scene at that time. But then you learn later down the line, Mancuso was playing it. Larry Levan was playing these Yeah, were- right, exactly. When I spoke to Francois, you know, I mean, I, I was asking him about how he got into dub, thinking he'd say, oh, King Tubby or Lee Perry or whatever like that. And he was like, "These <laughs> funk masters love money. And what it was, that record, why it was such an unusual record, it was made by reggae musicians and the TW, Tony Williams, was a reggae DJ on Radio London. And he right. didn't want to make a reggae record because he felt it would be bad form to play it on his own show. So he made a, a funk record. He, he based it on uh, Money In My Pocket and also Rapper's Delight. It was probably the first UK rap record. The other side is called Money No Love, vocal rapping. And I can't think of an earlier example of a, a, a rap record in, in, in the UK. Um, so it was a real hybrid track. And again, with Chicago, it got a bootleg there on a label called Siamese and went off all over again, you know, like in about 84, 85. So, you know, we had these, these records, but we didn't appreciate them or the, the, the British public didn't appreciate them. Um, some things came through, atmosphere, dancing out of space, those kind of things, you know, level 42, light of the world, high tension were big British jazz funk bands. Um, but, you know, there was a snobbery here that the real thing was America. American black music was the real thing. And mm-hmm. our stuff was just pretending. And it was unfair, really, when you had such creative music being made. But all that kind of changed with Soul to Soul later when they went so massive and stuff. Uh, then black British music had arrived and, and was on its own terms. But during that 70s, 80s period, I mean, some great, I mean, how about Simon, The Message? Yep. I mean, that was like, you know, early 70s and stuff. And that was uh, immigrants who'd come to the UK, you know, got together, African and, and West Indian immigrants. And, um, and that was a, I, I had that on an album, uh, kind of a black music album when I was about 13. I always presumed it was uh, American. It had things like Sly and the Family Stone, If You Want Me to Stay on there, and, you know, thing, I, and all the tracks were American tracks. And, um, and so it was only in retrospect that I realized that that was a British recording. Incredible. So yeah, that, we had it, we had it going on, but we looked to you for, you know, that was the where it all came from. And, right, the guidance, and then you yeah, took. I mean, we, we didn't look. I mean, there wasn't that thing with regards to G, club culture. Um, I don't think we were looking closely at U.S. club culture till the end of the seventies, and not even closely then, but the early eighties. I think by the early eighties, um, it was opening up, and we were really. I think what happened there was because of the newspapers around the world with Studio 54 every week yeah. publicizing what was going on in New York, of course, you know, all eyes are going to start looking at what's happening, the changes that happened drastically from this club opening up and becoming on a world circuit, even though if the music was commercial or not, but the visual part of it was over, it was over let's just say it overcompensated for people to now have another benchmark. Mm-hmm. They're saying, wow, what is this club? What is this club? Cause every time you turn around, superstars are walking in the club. It's your first kind of like social media situation where you have paparazzi hitting the clubs and now it's going to change club life for you guys. Because some of the owners I spoke to over the years would always tell me, Oh, I came to studio to see studio. I flew. I left England to come and see it and experience it. And some of them brought it back. Yeah. Some of them brought, tried to bring that. back what they thought, you know? It's like when I did that book, you know, I mean, some of the clubs um, mentioned are in Europe and uh, Canada. And, you know, there must be about three of those clubs that were, were, were kind of put together on the back of a visit to Studio 54. That the, the People wanted to bring that back to whatever city, whether it be Paris or, you know, uh, Montreal or whatever, and, and do the Studio 54. Um, you know, from our side with disco, 
you know, obviously Saturday Night Fever was, was, was a huge concern. Um, and I remember when the film came out, it wasn't negative. It was, there was a film about our culture, you know. I mean, I don't know, because you were there, you could see it closer up. But from where we were, they were it was a film about what we were into, about the, the music and everything. But that quickly turned because it, it commercialised it all. For me, now the Bee Gees were the band of disco, not the OJs, you know, that's where it had been. And now it was a white suited white guy who was the dancer, not a Afro haired black guy, you know, like Soul Train or whatever, you know, that the the imagery was changing and disco was becoming a little bit commercialized. And that is where the jazz funk scene really came through because it was the alternative. It was the place where you could go to get away from the more commercialized aspects of disco and just concentrate on the side of disco, the, the, the black side of disco, the disco funk. I mean, you know, probably the, the Euro disco side of it obviously eventually kind of leads off into the gay scene. Um, and the, the funk side of disco, you know, leads off into, you know, like areas like electro funk and what they call in the UK boogie. I mean, boogie. Boogie, yeah, boogie, yes. Boogie. The mid-80s term, and it came with the rare groove scene in London. We didn't call it that at the time, but it basically meant the disco funk of the late 70s and, and into the early 80s, some of the electronic stuff as well. So it was retrospective then, because they were going for this in 85 or mid-80s, and they were going back to the late 70s, early 80s, to find this, and the term boogie was put on it. Um, and so yeah, all these odd little terms that the British come up with. Yeah, then that's usually what happens, and then it gets genreed differently. And same music you're hearing, and as a boogie record, it's more like we think as a funk disco record. But you know, I remember there's a guy called Sean P. He's like a, you know a record aficionado in the UK, and he said that he was once in I think it was uh, in New York or certainly somewhere in America, and he was asking about have you got any boogie and the guy was thinking he wanted um, records about ghosts or something he was like, <laughs> <laughs> boogie music He's like what, halloween or you know, good so, uh, you know it brings us to a good point could you imagine saturday Night fever would have been written with a black undertone or a puerto rican undertone where it was all about a puerto rican dancer can someone in middle america who, who doesn't understand that culture of a gay nightclub opposed to a neighborhood nightclub, first of all, yeah. can really understand being that and seeing that, you know? So I can understand Robert Stigwood's machine behind it and why he went this way, because his, his group was the Bee Gees, I presume, if we all yeah. remember correctly, right? So what they did was they promoted the first song, How Deep Is Your Love?, and they told Paramount Pictures, if I remember correctly, it was How Deep Is Your Love. They told Paramount Pictures, if we get these records to go number one in this city, we need you to promote the film at the same time. It was a great promotion system. So what he did was he worked the records through Radio in America, got the record big in each area of the country, and then they pushed it. So they matched them dollar for dollar. That's why the thing blew up. And what did they go with? A ballad. Yeah. They didn't go with burn baby burn disco inferno they went with that why because they knew that slower tempo would attract a wider audience so now this the movie takes off and now grandma and grandpa are learning the bump and the disco and the new york hustle because the movie was all it was a great technique you know um that, it was like the whole story was always going to be flawed because I mean, what was, I mean, it's an amazing story to it was that the guy who, um, a guy called Nick Cohn had done um, a book called the Wap Bopper Lula in the late sixties. It was the first attempt at a kind of history of pop music and stuff. A, a writer. And he was the one who wrote that article, um, kind of New York Saturday night type article and talking about this club, um, Odyssey 2001, was it called, the club? Yeah. Was that real? real club, wasn't it? Yes, it was. It's in Bay Ridge. Yes, and my friend Ralphie D. That's right. you know, played. Yes, he played. And, 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 but he, 
he was that story he wrote was all out of his head. He was talking. He was writing about a, a character who was a mod in London in the sixties. That was where the story came from. So he hadn't been to, you know, these places, and it, it was um, it hadn't happened. I mean, it was written as a kind of just a, a story about somebody's life in New York, and um, it was a made-up story. And yet it was made into a film that was huge. And, and the album, I mean, people forget that at the time it was the biggest selling album of all time. And that was a yes. double album as well. The money generated from it, you know, like... So it went so big that it kind of became embarrassing for people who were originally, you know, lovers of this kind of disco. And when, when you got people trying to... Well, you know what it's like when you've got people who've just got into it, who think that they know about something and, you know, when that's happening at club level and the people who are originally there, they, they resent that. And, 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 you know, that step was easy here to step into this jazz funk sound that was emerging and been emerging since about 76. And, and that kind of took on, that became the credible side of the scene and, um, you know, the more commercial stuff was your Saturday night house at your general clubs, really.